it's about getting into schools and talking to young people because you know I, I know that people can change uh, and, it, and it's about talking to people and getting them to understand and perhaps step back from violence and, and prejudice and whatever and we just need to work together and keep on the good fight there absolutely Hey there guys, we are ecstatically happy to announce that we are associated with the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. The times are changing and with the unfortunate death of Sophie, those changes have made a massive impact for the future. If Sophie was with us still today, I can guarantee what you are doing will still be reaching so many lives of young teenagers, young adults and those who wish to be as different as possible so thank you very much to find out more about this incredible foundation and all the work they do and more importantly how you can help head on over to www.sophielancasterfoundation.com Hey, honey bunny, it's Rivka Reyes. This is Ron Wasserman, the nut that wrote Go Go Power Rangers. I'm Noel McNeil, and once upon a time, I was a bear in a big blue house. It's Rav himself. It's Paul Rugg, the voice of Freakazoid, and you're listening to the Chronicles of Podcast with Tom and Jamie. Hello! What's going on, guys? It's the 65th edition of the Chronicles of Podcast. This is how you get pointed at, whether you like it or not. It's it's Rav. I hate that joke, though. Root point. Like, ah, all right, Dad. Uh, I do believe, Jamie, that these right here, right about there, are the Chronicles of Wednesday 13. Oh, yes, they are. Yeah, I thought they might have been. And before we get out of here, oh, yeah. Right, let's get back on the road. <laughs> hello, hello, world. I'm Wednesday 13, not to be confused with Friday the 13th. You are watching the Chronicles of Podcast. Shall we um, bring in thine piece of resistance, Jamie? Did you yes, want me please. to bring that piece in? Yeah. Yes, Should we bring please. The piece in? I know how excited you've been for this one. So, welcome to the Chronicles of Wednesday 13. It's a good day. This is a Jamie episode. This is a Jamie interview, guys. Not that I, for lack of me wanting to speak, I just couldn't get a word in edgeways. So oh, say like it, that. And it's, but no, but it's not an issue. This is not an issue. This was one of Jamie's bucket list guests to get on the show. And we had Wednesday. And it, what's great is if you watch the interview, just watch Jamie's face. <laughs> that's all you need to do is you just literally watch it be like yeah oh my god that's a, <laughs> it's just love it's a lush though isn't it because you get to speak to one of your heroes of like 30 odd years yeah to be and uh, i tried my hardest not to fangirl i don't think i did i'm, I'm i know a little bit but i think i ran yeah, but you're allowed to a little bit everyone go watch the braden episode in 2020 and watch fucking me get like <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you know don't worry for those who are unfamiliar with Wednesday 13, first off, how the hell can you be unfamiliar with Wednesday 13? But back 20 years ago this year, a little ditty of an album came out called Beyond the Valley of the Murder Dolls. Murder Dolls were a side project of Slipknot drummer Joey Jordison. And Wednesday was the lead vocalist for that record. And my God, this album changed my life, quite frankly. I decided that I was going to go full in. I am now a ghoul scout, as the fans were called. I had a black shirt. I had red fishnets on my arm. I had a red PVC tie. Obsessed. I listened to this album at probably at least once a day. Like, just completely obsessed. And then Wednesday moved on from that when Joey went back to Slipknot, released an, uh, so many amazing albums, side projects and everything. And we're now here today. He's just released his brand new album, Horrifier. And it is incredible. And you should all go listen to Wednesday 13 I'm right now. Well, actually, should listen to interview first. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, listen to everything that Wednesday has to offer. I'm not going to lie to you. I think the toilet and the chicken are two of my, 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 my favourite stories I think I've ever heard from a guest. Um, oh, yeah. 
It's absolutely incredible. I'm really excited for you guys to hear this one. It's like I said, it's a very Jamie episode. So um, I literally just took a sit back and just let him and watch my boy go. It was uh, it was it was lovely. Um, so yeah, I I I pretty much Jamie'd like to get on with it. If that's okay with you. Absolutely. This, like I said, this is phenomenal. You're gonna love this one, people. <laughs> Jamie, yes, sir. Any words at all that you'd like to say that are final just a massive thank you to wednesday for taking a time out to come on our show and tell your stories about you about joey about everything just nah, i love this interview so much everyone enjoy it yeah so jamie sent me a picture i think five or ten minutes after we interviewed him i was like look i'm watching it um so <laughs> It was, it was, it was lovely. It's, we laughed, but it was, it was lush to see. It's always one of those moments where I'm like, I'm glad that happened. Like it, it like before I get started, as I said, I was watching some stuff yesterday and I was going back to it and I'm like, it's like a diary. Like, right? mm-hmm. look at these people we've spoken to. It's incredible. And now we get to add Jamie's bucket list. We get to add Wednesday 13 to the, to the, uh, to the collection. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, interviewing this week, it's Wednesday 13. Ladies and gentlemen, this week we bring you an incredible legendary guest, a man who became a huge part of my life 25 years ago when I picked up an album called Beyond the Valley of the Murder Dolls. This week's guest career has spanned over 30 years and many records, including his brand new album, Horrifier. It is an honour to say we welcome the Duke of Spook, the leader of the Ghoul Scouts, because ladies and gentlemen, these are the chronicles of Wednesday 13. <laughs> No one's ever done that yet. That's actually my favourite. (laughs) (laughs) Wonderful. But um, Wednesday, a big question I think I had to ask everybody is, how have the last two years been for you? How's your pandemic season been? Horrible. Horrible. (laughs) Uh, I don't think anybody had a a good time, but uh, I had an extra horrible time. So it wasn't my favourite. Even just coming out of it this year, uh, even being able to tour and stuff, it still had the the lag of that still kind of holding on. It just kind of, you know, I had the I had the ball rolling, I had the momentum going, and then it just everything went down like every everything else. And uh, so yeah, it, it sucked. I, uh, I I hope we don't have anything like that again any anytime soon. And uh, I hope all the worst is behind us. Yeah, I'm sorry yeah, to hear that you didn't have a good summer for us. Awful. Um, you know, it suck. It does suck us, but at least hopefully we're at the other side now and we don't have to experience anything like that ever again. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, f- I especially felt sorry for people that work in, you know, the music industry and the arts because that is your life. It's you going out there, you're touring, you're doing, you're amongst people, you know. Yeah, you know, it was weird. Like for me, you know, I, you know, a lot of people, you know, think that, uh, just because I'm the front guy of a band, I've been doing this forever. I don't have like this, this uh, antisocial kind of, you know, uh, fear when I get around people and stuff and being on stage and being able to do that every single night for years was got me out of being shy, I guess. Uh, But having those two years off, you know, it's like I had to start all over again. You know, I found myself Mm. on stage, you know, making eye contact with people going, Whoa, that feels weird. What's up? You know, so bad. Yeah, it's like it's like relearning the 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 old tricks again. So it's been a it's been a b- bizarre bizarre time. I imagine it. Is. I always wondered if like half the musicians got on stage, went to sing, and they're like, "I can't remember the words to these songs I've been singing for so many years because I've not done it in such a long time." <laughs> um, you know what? I, I I don't usually have that happen a lot. There's usually one song per tour that I'll get some lyrics wrong. And, uh, and it's usually just one song, but once I can kind of correct myself, I'll make like a little cheat sheet and I'll tape it to my, to the floor one day and I'll just kind of stare at it for two days and I memorize it. And, um, but no, I've been really good at remembering these, these lyrics, uh, you know, just, uh, it's weird. I, they just, they come back to me. I don't really, uh, before a tour, I don't like go back and reread the lyrics or, really listen to it i just kind of jump into it and it just it kind of it, it comes back it's like the alphabet you know sometimes i flub it you know like a like a like a field sobriety test sometimes you'll flub it. uh but but overall you know i i i 
I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm not in need of a, of a teleprompter yet. But who knows? So there's a the moment you just hold the microphone over the crowd and go, you sing. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. That's the old, the old Vince Neil trick. <laughs> so a question I like to ask all of our guests, take us back, sir, to the days when you were a young wee lad, young master 13, we could say. What did you want to be when you were growing up? Was it always music? No, no. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I tell this story all the time, like, or just I tell stories about this all the time. But it's pretty much made me who I am, what I do, the way I sound, the way I, I write music, just everything. You know, when I was when I was really young, I'm talking like, you know, five, six years old. You know, I was watching rated R movies. I was watching action movies. I was watching first blood you know uh when it first came out uh, chuck norris was a was a was a pretty big big star at the time at least to me he was he was the man at, at that time he had a lot of movies on my family had like an illegal hbo cinemax hookup uh and our and our so i had you know non-stop cable you know and uh and and i lived in a, in a little trailer when i was with my mom and my brother and my sister and you know, I didn't have a bedroom, so my bedroom was the living room. So when my parents would go to sleep, I just watched these movies and I watched all these action movies and Rambo and all of this stuff. So music wasn't even anywhere on my mind. If I if I liked music at all, it was because it was a soundtrack or something for a, for a movie. Uh, mm. But, you know, I was and during the time in the 80s, you know, you could go out as a kid and 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 buy toy guns and toy army helmets and everything and it looked like real stuff there was a company called intertech i wish i had it nearby i would show you i have one of these guns there's a water gun from like 1983 that looks like a real machine gun and they had the, the company got shut down because some people robbed the bank with it because they looked real and uh so i was this kid that just had this like boxes and boxes i mean like like trunks full of like guns you know like you would see like rambo or commando when he would go to his gun room and just you know i had that in toy guns so to answer your question what did i want to be i thought i was going to be like a one-man army i wanted to be <laughs> i wanted to be like rambo i wanted to be like a cool cop you know like the undercover i didn't want to be like on a team i didn't want to be a part of a group i didn't i just you know i thought you know and this is back in the 80s when when movies like Red Dawn had just came out, we we thought we were going to war with with Russia, uh, and it was you know uh, so in my mind you know when I saw Red Dawn and I you know you know I've watched the movie since it came I just recently watched it again and the scene where there's the kids are in the classroom and they just see the paratroopers coming down in the in the in the in the playground like I wanted that to happen. <laughs> I mean, in my brain, you know, I'm like going, man, I mean, you know, I've got toy guns. What am I thinking I want to do with it? You know, but in my brain, <laughs> I'm like, if I could just get a hold of some real guns, I could probably maybe take out Russia. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of the, the deal. Uh, and uh, that led into music, I guess, around like fifth or sixth grade. I started getting into rock music and stuff. My brother was turning me on to a, to a lot of cool stuff and um and i was in a talent show in sixth grade i was trying to impress this girl so uh white snakes uh uh um uh, album was was like the number one album in the in the world at that time and uh they had the here i go again they had just put out uh, still the night was the first video and then they had just released their ballad you know every band puts out the ballad on the third video and uh, it was their ballad for is this love and I liked this girl in sixth grade. I'm like, man, what if we lip sync to this at the talent show? I'll get this girl to pay attention to me. And it worked. Yes. yes. <laughs> Played it. We got to stand an ovation. I got this girl to be my girlfriend. And then I realized the power of music. And I went, <laughs> I don't think I want to fight Russia anymore. I, think I want to maybe grow my hair out and, and stop this lip syncing <laughs> to do something. So that pretty much set it up for me. So that was the transition. Although it was, it's still hard. You know, I, I still have the Rambo, Chuck Norris, Charles Bronson side to me there, but uh, you know, that's just, uh, you know, that's just my fantasy, my fantasy world now. Oh, Which thank you so much, David like Coverdale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Would you not want to ever incorporate the army side of things? Because obviously your shows are quite, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like they're big spectacles, aren't they? So wouldn't you not want to yeah. ever incorporate like an army thing to the show at all? 
Uh, the well, we have our song Rambo, so that's about as army as it gets. So I, okay. you know, <laughs> uh, depending on where we are, I have a over in in the UK uh, where we have like our a bunch of our other gear. We have like gears. Like all this stuff behind me, I tried to cover up with this terrible sheet here. I'm basically <laughs> in my storage space with all of our gear. We just got off tour last week, so all my gear is behind me. But um, uh, in the UK, I have one of my my favorite Rambo guns. It's actually like a uh, – it's not a real – well, it's a real gun, but it's not a – it's a, like an airsoft gun, but it looks – it's okay. awesome. Mm-hmm. Customized with a Rambo logo on it. It's got a laser sider on it so I can point out in the crowd. Uh <laughs> But everybody knows it's a fun song, so they don't think I'm just an insane. Well, they I'll say they don't think I'm an insane person. They they may think I'm an insane person. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, that's about as far as I incorporate any any type of uh, of that. What I was just speaking about. So uh, that's always fun when you can get a, a an entire audience, a club filled full of people chanting R A M B O, blow them up like Rambo. That's uh, an achievement in in my world. Absolutely love it. I- and also one of my favorite songs. So there we go. Um, what obviously you're saying you got into music. What made you want to incorporate that love of horror and stuff like that into your music in the first place? Because it's gone for your, your entire career. You know, that's been like your calling card. What made you want to incorporate that? Well, um, talking about how I watched all of the these movies and stuff as a you know as a kid when I probably should have been watching them. You know, I was watching all the action movies. But I was also watching all the the horror movies as well. I was watching Creep Show and, and Nightmare on Elm Street and uh, Friday the Thirteenth Part Three and Four when it came out. All these big movies that are like in my mind. I just I remember seeing them when they were when they first came out. And as you know, seven eight years old watching them when I shouldn't have been been watching these movies. Um, but when I started um, when I started getting into music and started learning how to play, I started with guitar. Uh, but I was always writing lyrics and stuff. And when I really uh, became a lyricist and started writing songs, you know, I basically, I can't remember who I asked one time. I just said, you know, I asked some guy in a local music store that used to go hang around and watch play guitar. And I'm like, what do you, what do you write about? And he's like, write about what you know, dude. <laughs> play guitar. <laughs> and I was like, what do I know? So I went home kind of with that just, ringing in my head what do you know and i'm like well i know about horror movies i know about all this stuff i really like the imagery of that uh, so i just literally sang about what i know about and uh so that's where like some of my earlier stuff was really movie movie driven or or, or something came from a line in a movie that that, mm. that that made a song so that's always been my my go to, and I still do that to this to this day. Like even the, the new the latest album, there's there's a song about the Halloween movie. There's a song about Christine the car. Uh, so I'm still pulling from what what I know about, and uh, and that's always easy for me to to go to that stuff. Uh, writing out of the box is 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 hard for me. It's like playing a hard board game. I don't I don't want to do that. <laughs> Yes. So it's what I used to love, and like especially the early Frankenstein drag queen stuff. Like you'd always have that like sound clip from a movie at the start of the song, and like, if I'd watch a film and I'd hear it, I'm like, I know where I know that from. It's, it's yeah, like, it's like FDQ bingo. It was great. Yes, it's fun. I I've done that with some with several bands, uh, just finding hearing samples and things like that from from movies. I even catch myself these days. And I'll hear a sample. I was watching Halloween five the other day. Or it was a four. Oh, Halloween four was on the other day. And uh I heard a sample from Frankenstein Drag Queens on, on there as well. And I was like, whoa, mm. I forgot about that. There's several from that four and five. I um, but yeah, I, I forget about some of that stuff sometimes. Speaking of Halloween, as it is a sort of a hot topic at the moment, and you're such a lover of horror. What did you mm-hmm. think of Hall- Halloween ends? Oh man. Um <laughs> I can tell you I had probably one of the the best times ever at a movie theater going to see that. Uh, we had a day off and uh, we went as the band and our and our crew and everything, like eight or nine of us went to the movie Amazing. theater on um, the day before, it, like right at the eve of it coming out. Like it was like, I don't know, like a 10 o'clock showing and there was nobody in there but us. 
It was amazing. Really? It was like we had our own private theater. So <laughs> we were just loud and goofy. And I think about 30 minutes into watching it, you know, I didn't want to like sit up and be like, what do you guys think? Cause I could just feel it in the, and we just went, <laughs> uh, this is horrible. So <laughs> we just ate more popcorn, laughed. And then it kind of, then it sort of became mystery science theater where everybody said something and then we were making a smart comment and it was just, it was hilarious. Um, but again, I didn't go there with this big, like faith in, and, you know, Oh man, the Halloween franchise is going to be rescued. Like I wasn't, that thrill with with the second one or the one before it i kind of checked out on the halloween movies i think whenever uh buster rhymes came in into it oh, and i was yeah. like all right i'm not i'm out of here on that one that was what <laughs> one that was um but yeah i just i went to see it just because it was fun it was a cool idea to go with it and, and we had a we had a great time um but yeah for me that's not what what I would want in, in, in a Halloween movie to no. end. Um, I thought the 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 last one was weird and just kind of all over the place. And this one just went <laughs> even worse than that. So again, I'm not trying to shit on a movie or say it's horrible. Some people, these new Halloween movies are the, their first introduction to Halloween, you know, mm. and they think it's great, you know. And I, if I, if I was younger, didn't know anything about it, maybe I'd have a different mindset on it. But I grew up like watching Michael Miley would te- terrify me as a kid, you know? And uh, so I have a special place in him with, with him in my heart of just like, he was the face of horror and he was the scariest thing. And just to see how that image is just kind of, I don't know. It just kind of, it's not as scary as it, as it, as it used to be. So I try to remember it as I, as I liked it in the earlier days, like the first first two films. Yeah, he's not Michael hiding in a tunnel. Let's be <laughs> no, that was weird. And then they and then they did the thing of he stares in the kid's eyes and he's <laughs> going into. I'm like, no, they're not doing this. I saw this in a movie called Vice Versa, where a guy and his and a kid changed personalities with that Fred Savage uh, kid from the 80s. I'm like, they're not going to pull a Vice Versa, are they? So that movie was all over the place and it was just, and then, and then the opportunity to, to use a new mask and they gave the guy the goofy kind of candy corn mask or whatever it was. Yeah. And I was like, that looks like something you'd see at the checkout at, at my grocery store. Maybe that's what they wanted, but like, you know, I'm always thinking outside of the box when I watch movies or watch sequels and I just like so many missed opportunities. Like they could have brought in the silver shamrock mask or something and had, the kid yes. wears one of those or have or it's, it's something different than he possesses some kid and lives down in the sewer. I don't know. <laughs> it, just, it, was, it was it was weird. I don't know. I'm glad it's over with and we'll just wait for the next the next batch of them to come out with some new director and you know we'll we'll see. But uh, I'm okay with the originals. Absolutely. So one thing that always drew me to you as an artist, as Tom mentioned earlier, you've always added that theatrical element to your music, whether it be the giant umbrella, the brushing your teeth on stage. I remember that from back in the Murder Dolls days. Yeah. Is that, you did that like right from the beginning, Maniac, Spider Trash, FDQ, all that sort of stuff. Where does that come from, adding that theatrical element to the show? It's all stuff I've seen on TV. Everything, the, the TV was my was my world everything you know i i lived in front of a tv up until i went on tour when i was 25 26 years old and i finally was detached from that and i got to tour and see the world but before that my my eyes were on was on tv on tv every every little little thing that that uh is 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 inspired by like the uh the, the toothbrush thing you know, so people would just think, oh, that's just a random thing. I'm like, yeah, it is random, but that's that's Pee Wee Herman. That's Pee Wee Herman in, in the movie where he's brushing his teeth, you know, and he had, the, you know, he had the big toothbrush. So that was the that's where that came from. The uh, the umbrella. Uh, what that eventually became was what I call the fuck umbrella now, because we play that song and I, I, I use it. But originally I did it back in like. 93 or 94 i was watching some old uh uh 
cartoons, some Looney Tunes cartoons and the the coyote and the roadrunner. And he was holding an umbrella and the lightning strikes the umbrella. And it's, and, <laughs> and it's, just, the, it's just the skeleton of the umbrella. So what I used to do is I used to bring an umbrella out on stage and just open it. And it was just just the wire. And I would just hold it and sing a song. And that just looked cool. It was just like, what the fuck's this guy doing? And then that turned into Murder Dolls being on tour, opening up for Papa Roach, which was not our audience. And this is like in 2002. Uh, so, you know, we had a handful of our fans there, but for the most part, we're fighting a 1,500, 2,000 capacity audience that wants to hear you know, Papa Roach and the new metal. So those guys were our friends and it was a cool tour, but like music wise, we were up against an, an obstacle on it. So every night I was trying to think, what can I do to engage the crowd or fuck with them or say something or, you know, just to get a rise out of them. So it was raining one day going into the, to the venue. And I looked over and saw the umbrella and I went, what if I write fuck on that? Just, that was it just a thought and then joey's like yeah and you could use it on stage you know and, and and use it on that song and then that became and we tried it out and it finally got the audience to like us they kind of put up with us and then that was our last song i love to say fuck and we had everybody in the place chanting because everybody loves to say fuck you know so <laughs> that was how we won them over uh, and then that went into us, you know, and that became the staple of, of the show. The, the fuck umbrella saved, saved our, saved our lives as far as like winning the audience over. So just, I've always used humor, uh, it's, at least when it comes for me, use humor to win the audience over than trying to go to this extreme. Oh, let me make you believe I'm the scariest, darkest creep. You know what I mean? I would rather go for the. I call the Beetlejuice route, you know, that's the fun, a lot of that, yeah. humorous, humorous route to it. So that's kind of where all those props and the sense of humor and, and all that comes from is comes from those, those kind of movies. You know, I, as much as I love a, a really serious, scary horror movie, like the shining or something like that, you know, I love Pee Wee's big adventure. That's, you know, I'm, I'm equal in, in those worlds. So I'm able to do that with my music. I'm able to, to write about those, those things, uh, the imagery, everything, you know, uh, I think people know I don't take myself too seriously. At least the fans know that, you know, when you put a quote up on Blabbermouth or something about me and you read those comments and people that don't know me, they think I'm that serious, you know, guy that walks around all day with, with makeup on, you know, I just wear sunglasses in my house. That's all I do guys. That's <laughs> As evil as it gets, <laughs> you can't be evil twenty four seven. Even even the evil needs a break. Yes, <laughs> hard to be evil twenty four. I tried it. It's not fun. I gave up. I didn't even make it twenty four hours trying to be twenty four hours a day. Gave up. Speaking of the theater of your live shows, there's a story rumor I heard many years ago about like early days of your career, and I just want to clarify if this is true because it's one of those stories. I'm I need to know if this is true. I heard back in the days of FDQ, you used to feed KFC to a chicken on stage. Is this true? Partially true. Uh, he never made it to the stage to try the the chicken live. Uh, let me back this up. <laughs> so I lived in North Carolina. I grew up in North Carolina. Uh, and... It's, you know, I lived out in the country uh, and it was common to be driving down some country road and see a sign out front for someone that goes, you know, tomatoes, you know, or or pecans for, you know, come by and get it. And then it's also not rare to see chickens for sale. <laughs> I saw a sign driving down the road, chicken for sale, like two bucks, three bucks, something like that. So I'm like, <laughs> back it up. And uh, I sent my girlfriend in there because she looked normal. And I think at the time I had like purple <laughs> hair and I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen. So yeah, she went up to this old farmer guy and, and they sold it, sold her a chicken for a couple of bucks and put it in like a 
cardboard box and I took it back to my house and uh, I went to Home Depot and bought some chicken wire and some two by fours. And I built this cool little cage out in my garage and it was right next to where we rehearsed and he was going to be our stage chicken. (laughs) So I built I built a little cage for him that would travel with us. And we were a three piece band at the time and my OCD just couldn't put the placement of a three piece band. I was like, man, it just looks weird. You know, we got to, I can't stand in the middle. So we got to have, so the chicken set the balance off. He was the middle guy. And, and I built him a cool little, like I call the Tweety bird cage. I built it and, uh, and we just, we put him in, in the cage. And so he was in the center and we played, I believe two shows with the chicken and, uh, <laughs> We were going to play the following weekend, and I remember, like I said, I built this cool little cage for him in the rehearsal spot, and uh, I was waiting for the band guys to show up for rehearsal one day, and I just came in, and I had a box of KFC, and I was eating my chicken, and I'm just like, you know, munching down on it, and a piece of chicken (laughs) fell into the chicken cage, and the chicken jumped down, and he ate it immediately, and I was like, (laughs) what? Whoa, this chicken just ate chicken. <laughs> I could turn this into like a like I'm I'm thinking like a like a like some sort of like green <laughs> guy at a circus, and I'm like going, ah, I can announce this as the cannibal chicken. And <laughs> I'll be part of the show where I bring out a bucket of KFC and I just feed it chicken. Like people would think that was the most insane thing, whether they liked us or not, they would remember that forever. And, uh, so that was the plan. And, uh, I don't know what, what, what happened. Uh, it was a hot summer. I don't know if, 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 uh, he died from a heat overdose, but the day of the show, I went out and he was, he was legs up. No. Yeah. So he didn't make it to his, I mean, it was going to be his big show. Oh, man. so yeah, a lot of people didn't like the fact we had a chicken on stage. I don't think you can get away with doing that these days. Probably this is the nineteen ninety. This is nineteen ninety six. So, uh, but yeah, back back in nineteen ninety six, we were you know we played the kind of venues that. Uh, I mean, I guess we didn't really ask; we just did it. Like we used to bring, like I said, we brought a chicken. Uh, we used to do our own pyrotechnics. I used to build my own pyro. Uh, you know, we used to do that all the time and we would, and we'd be the opening band and they'd be, okay, here you guys, you got a 30 minute set. I'm like, cool. Let me set up these things of gunpowder over here. <laughs> we'd come out with a Frankenstein drag queen <laughs> fire behind us. I have no idea if it's going to go good or bad. <laughs> nobody watching. We're just like, just go for it. Just look forward. And if nobody's screaming, <laughs> you're not. <laughs> Uh, on fire go for it so uh we used to do all kinds of weird stuff like that uh the chicken was was the was the greatest was the greatest thing uh we ever used uh and then uh, and the toilet we used to have on stage too was was a uh, was a cool little stage thing too I actually made the uh uh offended a lot of people especially in north carolina uh i made a nativity scene around the uh, toilet i had a real toilet on stage and uh <laughs> Some friends of mine around Christmas went in someone's yard and stole all the their yard uh, decorations. They sold they stole little baby Jesus, uh, Mary and Joseph, and they were just like big plastic light up <laughs> things. And they brought them to my house and go, "Hey, you want these?" And I'm like, "Yes, but no, but I'll take them. <laughs> shut the door." Uh, so. Those became and my, my dad. So we rehearsed out in the garage next to my parents' house and my dad had just replaced the toilet and we had an old toilet sitting out there. And I just went, Hmm. All right. What we'll put little baby Jesus on the toilet seat and that's the manger. And then we'll put Joseph and Mary around it. And then I'll put some cool little decorative lights on it. And that will be, the piece in the middle of the stage to break up the irony of the three piece. Like I said, my OCD with that. So there was always something. So the toilet and the chicken, unfortunately those were never merged together, but can you imagine if it would have been? 
Oh, oh. oh. A dream that could have been. I could have made a chicken cage toilet. <laughs> <laughs> never too late. It's never too late. Never too late. I smell a reunion. What's up, guys? <laughs> I've got this toilet and a chicken, shall we? Yeah. <laughs> One more round, guys. I got something I got to do. <laughs> you have no idea how badly I want that to happen there. <laughs> so one thing I've always loved about you is obviously we've spoke about the different themes to your music and whatnot, whether it be horror-inspired like Haddonfield, for example, or silly songs like I Love to Say Fuck, like we said. Uh, or you've got like deep and personal songs like Skeletons. Do you use your music as like therapy in a sense? Just put over those different sides of your personality, or is it just that sounds like a fun idea? Yeah, I don't do it that often, but uh, but yeah, there's occasional songs like like you said, like uh, where I don't sing about Rambo, and I'm like, you know what, I need to, you know, I need to sing about this. I don't have to, and people may not know what I'm talking about because I'll sing about it in some other. I'll disguise it, but uh, but yeah, I've definitely used it as as therapy. Sometimes I'll pick certain songs, but overall, I just think music is has always been therapy for me. Whether I'm listening to other people's music that I like that gets me in a good mood or gets me out of a bad mood, or uh, but being able just to just to play music and and know you have an audience that that wants to hear it or wants to hear new stuff or you know, so that's a uh, that's always a, a, a exciting for me. So it's always it's always therapy in some way. Mm. But uh, but yes, I get what you're saying. I, I I do use it as 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 therapy sometimes. I mean, getting out of the whole COVID experience and having this album. Luckily, I had something to channel some of those emotions into. You know, so uh, I don't always have the that kind of stuff to you know on the side of working on a record. So that kind of made it a little difficult as well. But I'm glad I. I had that because had we not been recording, I don't know what else I would have done. I don't know. I probably would have picked up my throwing star habit a little more, maybe. <laughs> what is, uh, what's a Wednesday 13 like vocal process, like writing process work? Like, do you guy, get the guys to put music first and put lyrics to it, or do you write stuff first? Or just go, do you know what? I'm going to write about chickens, like you were saying earlier. Um, how does it actually, how does your process actually work? Um, it's different every time. It's never been a certain way. I mean, there can be, uh, you know, I could be in my car driving and come up with a chorus or something in my head. And then I have to come home and pick up my guitar and then try to write it. That can happen that way. Sometimes I can have a guitar riff for months and months and months, get the band together. We play it, we make the music and I'm still stumped. I have no idea what to do with, with the lyrics. And then it'll be me sitting around watching TV going, oh, I should write about Christine. Okay. <laughs> you know, and that's kind of, that's kind of the way uh, certain, certain things happen with, with the, uh, with the writing process. So uh, it's, it's different every time. So I'm, I'm glad it's different. Um, and then sometimes stuff will just, just surprise me. I never, I never know. Well, I seem to have lost my co-host. I don't know what's Uh-oh. actually happened, happened to him. Uh, I'm still here. I don't know what's happened to my camera. I've disappeared. Oh, you are. Okay, I'm still that's here. fine. <laughs> uh, you, Apparently, you, they don't want me to be seen on camera. It's the ghost of that chicken <laughs> haunting these. He's haunting the Zoom. Because when we were talking about, you know, you trying these different things, is that mm-hmm. the reason why you tried projects like Gunfire Seventy Six and Bourbon Crow? Just you know, just wanting to show that different side of your personality that might not fit like the Wednesday 13 brand, as they say. Yeah. I mean, at, at the time when I did those, that was during, uh, you know, I just came out of, out of Murder Dolls in 2003. I realized that wasn't going to be like a full-time thing with Joey doing Slipknot and just, you can't compete against uh, the monster Slipknot. It's just, it, it just, so, you know, and that's when I started doing the Wednesday 13 uh solo stuff i didn't really have a whole lot of time to think about it i just i just wrote music so those first three albums up to skeletons uh you know i think that's why those three albums sound different from each other because it was such a uh my brain was in a different places you know the, the first album just kind of came out most of those songs on transylvania record were songs i didn't use or i had kind of wrote hoping it would be the new murder dolls maybe uh you know and 
so when the second album came around, I wanted to do something totally different. That's why I made like a punk rock record with the Fang Bang album. The third album, I was listening to different stuff. So I made more of a darker record. So you can just see where my brain was shifting on it. And uh, so the Bourbon Crow Project came out around that time as well. And the same thing with, with Gunfire 76. I just, you know, I guess I was kind of, I don't say I was confused musically. I just had a lot of things I wanted to do. And I thought if I changed the ingredients of what Wednesday 13 was too rapidly incorporating those things in, that wouldn't have worked. I would have just sunk the ship. So I went, I'll do the Bourbon Crow as a project. I'll They'll give me a break from it. Gets my mind off of that. So when I did come back to Wednesday 13, later on, I had a better idea of what I wanted to do more time to think about it you know it was just uh it was a process because i never really planned to be a solo artist i just went i better start doing something or i'm gonna have to go back to kmart and go to work so, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know so i just and luckily i had my foot in the door with with roadrunner records and uh you know, they put my first album out i've just been really fortunate that you know, I'm putting out my my ninth album, you know, on a on a legit label with more with Napalm now. We last one was Nuclear Blast. We've been with Roadrunner. We've been, you know, it's been it's been a lot of a lot of uh a lot of labels and a lot of a lot of records. And I've and I've survived a lot of these trends. I've survived bands, I've survived uh all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and I'm able to still be here and 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 do what I do and it's I haven't had to compromise to any of those things. Good, because at the end of that, there is only one Wednesday 13 out there that you don't listen to a Wednesday 13 record and go, oh, that sounds like, you know, it's <laughs> your voice is so unique, that style and everything like that. So thank God you didn't give up and thank God you kept persevering because, you know, I, I, I'm a very happy man. So. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I don't ever see it that often, but, you, you know, when you, if you do happen to glance comments on Facebook or something, you know, Facebook is just, I don't know, the people on there just, just seems they, their comments are just worse <laughs> than, than, than uh, but you can just see certain people just the way they'll comment on stuff. And uh, if I ever see the, the words sell out, he sold out and signed to a list, like, selling out, selling out would be me not trying to look like a dead person on stage or, <laughs> Uh, you know, selling out would be trying to do something that's, you know, selling out arenas or something. You know, I could barely sell out a, a, a club I play, you know, so it's just uh, but like I said, I've I've done what I've always done. I've stuck to my guns. I haven't compromised to to new music standards. I still write the way I always have. You know, that's why people hear a lot of the 80s influence in my music, because that's what I grew up listening to a lot of the hair metal stuff a lot of people hear motley crew in our music and uh but they'll also hear the heavier stuff that i listened to as i as i got older so uh i don't know i've been able to do this you know so long that now i don't really have to do side projects to do different sounding songs so we can have a song like insides out which is super heavy and different than what i've done but i didn't have to start a side project to do that because we don't need more than one song like that so mm -hmm. it's cool to be able to to do that. And I think people, or at least the fans that have stuck around for all the album, I think they've come to expect us to experiment a little bit. And that's only, I think what artists want to do as you've been doing this for so long is, is you always want to venture and try something new because you do this for so long. It's if it gets easy for me, that's not fun. I, it needs to, it needs to test my patience. It needs to test my musical abilities these days. It needs to, check all those boxes you know it'd be easy to go back and write a i won't say be easy to go back and write a frankenstein drag queen album but just the idea of it sounds easy to me as opposed to just going yeah. hey you gotta write a new wednesday 13 album right now i'll be like oh oh i need some time you know so as i said in my intro this year marks 25 years since the release of beyond the valley of the murder dolls which made me feel very old when i realized that it, it, it was a true monumental album in my life you know i i was all aboard i was a ghoul scout black shirt red fishnets on my arms god knows okay. why looking back i look ridiculous but i just loved it all as i met you several times during that period i think i even gave you a pvc tie that you said you'd wear on stage one time i can't believe i'm admitting this to public but <laughs> for the, but 
But for those unaware, how did that project come about in the first place? Um, basically, from what I understand uh, from from the beginning of it, because I guess the, I always start with with Joey. Joey was the you know he was the guy that put the whole idea together. Um, and Joey had a band in in Iowa called the Rejects that he had I think prior to Slipknot. And when Slipknot took off and started doing stuff, Joey would always come back. And if he had, say, New Year's off, he would do a New Year's reject show. And it sort of became the annual thing uh, for several years that the rejects would do a, a New Year's show. So um, I had got uh, mentioned in that group of people with Joey involved with the rejects uh, about playing uh, guitar or bass or something for one of the reject shows, uh, in, in two, in the year 2000. Um, and for some reason they went with someone else and had them play it. And then the following year, that's when I get contacted about working on this rejects project with Joey from Slipknot. Um, so I flew up there to, to do, uh, to meet Joey and work on, uh, I guess what would be the demos or whatever, for what was going to be the rejects because joey's like slipknot's going on a hiatus after this album and i want to put this side project out and we want you to play bass and i'm like bass <laughs> all right because they already had a vocalist they had a they had a you know guitarist in mind i don't play drums uh so but at the time i was like you know what i'm working in north carolina delivering magazines driving a delivery truck just not doing what I, what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in a rock band touring the world. And um, so I was like, I'll do it. You know, anything, I'll do anything to get out of, out of this. Uh, but it was also using my music. So I'm like, well, this is okay. We'll see what happens. So either way, within six months of us getting together, working on those demos, it just switched around. And Joey was like, I don't want to call it the rejects. I don't want to use this vocalist. I want to use you as the vocalist and we're going to revamp the whole band and we'll find new guys and it'll be mine and your band. And uh, we'll hire the, the, the guys to be the, the touring lineup and you and I'll be the songwriters. And that's what it became even on the second album and everything. But, uh, but that's kind of how it, how it just, it, it just happened. I think once, once Joey and I started working on it, and him not thinking about it being the rejects, he could think about it in a different light. Mm. Uh, and me being the vocalist and getting that opportunity, which is what I wanted to do anyway, I was more than excited. So the enthusiasm on my on my part of that record and everything is all natural. It's all true because I was I was getting the opportunity in my life. I felt like to do it, and it did. It changed it changed my world, you know. Because uh, after that, I I quit my day job, and this is what I what I do now. And, uh, you know, so, uh, that was something that I was, wasn't sure if it was going to work out, but I didn't give up. I, I just said, uh, I'm taking this opportunity. And had I not taken that opportunity, where, where would I be? I have, I have no idea. So, uh, so yeah, that record's super, super important to me. It changed, it changed my world. And I learned so much just within that year of that album coming out and going on tour and, um, you know, just, you know, I went from playing bars in front of 50 to a hundred people or hundred people. If I was lucky, um, uh, testing those gags, testing out the fuck umbrella, test, <laughs> or, you know, testing out weird stuff and getting a reaction out of 50 people, but to go and play in front of Iron Maiden's audience and have like 30,000 people either give you a good reaction or a bad reaction. That was amazing. Uh, and I learned what to do. I learned what not to do. I learned to never say, throw us your money because you could get hurt really bad by European coins. Uh, <laughs> I learned that the hard way. Uh, but we would always take, yeah, we'd play in front of Iron Maiden. Uh, we did six weeks supporting Iron Maiden as Murder Dolls in 2003. And as good as that sounds, <laughs> that is good for a band that comes out with red fishnets and lipstick uh, in front of Iron Maiden's audience. It was uh, it was a fight every day to, to win them over. 
And uh, I remember in some of the earlier days, I think it was in Sweden of all play. We played like an Olympic arena uh, in Sweden or something. It's a huge place. And uh, someone threw some money and I was like, oh, great. Throw, throw some more. And it was just a shower of coins. And Ooh. once we cleaned it up, we made about a couple hundred bucks in like euros <laughs> uh, on stage. We just went to the bar and drank our wounds away. Um, so, yeah, little things like that. You know, you learn, you know, not to say it in front of 30,000 people, throw us, <laughs> throw us your money because it could kill you. In a bar, I could say that and I'd maybe get hit once or twice, but not. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't learn so uh but yeah man that was a that was an awesome time uh in in, in my life and it was just uh it changed it changed everything it's it, did you expect it to blow up like it did though because you know well tours including like the i made one you just said performing on top of the pops if you even in an episode of dawson's creek for god's sake all of one album it's insane yeah it was for for one year of because you know basically that was the album came we started promoting it in like june like the, did a promo tour um and from that point on we just had these opportunities we were with the right the right management uh at the time the iron maiden thing happened because management uh worked with iron maiden uh so it was an easy thing it was just oh well hey take out this up and coming band and you know, you guys can look like the heroes that help break them or whatever. But um, yeah, the Iron Maiden tour was not a successful thing on our on our part. I don't know that it did anything for us other than give us that experience because the audience was not very kind to to. I mean, Iron Maiden's audience is just. I mean, it's a there's an army of guys, you know, and we're used to playing our own shows where half the audience is girls. So it's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. just people just, they, it was just the mentality. I felt like I went back in a time machine every day and went, here I go. I got to fight these, fight these guys from the eighties every day. The guys with the denim jackets and hair down the waist. And, you know, anytime they would see anybody walking, we didn't have eyebrows. We just, you know, we were, <laughs> we were weird, you know, we were playing in the daylight so you could see how weird we were. So, uh, to win that audience over, that was, a uh, that was a crazy thing, but like, we just had all these opportunities that, that we took, uh, you know, and then even when the band came off tour, I mean, we got offered, we like, soon as, soon as the band went on tour and Joey went back to Slipknot, we got offered to go out with type of negative. We got offered to go out with Alice Cooper, all at ministry, all within like three months of that. So there was just so many could have things that we, we could have done. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just, like I said, that was all within a year and we just had a, we had a buzz because there was really nothing going on. This is like pre my chemical romance. This is, you know, I think AFI had just came out. So it was that little break in between new metal and the emo screamo stuff. And we were just, here we are. <laughs> what do we do? Well, I don't know. <laughs> we, we're, we're somewhere between Motley Crue and Marilyn Manson. What do we, what do we do here? So uh, it worked. It was it was like perfect, perfect timing on that. And I think I mean that was why I've been able to to continue to do do what I do. I love it. Look, but before we talk about what you're doing now, though, I did just want to take just take a second. Like obviously last year we we lost Joey, and it was absolutely heartbreaking. I've, that's just for us fans, you know. He was a brother. He was family to you, but. Do you have any like particular favorite memories of Joey? Just those stories you just think of and smile from like, ear to ear. Um, yeah, I mean, you know what? There's usually stories I tell where it's just, you know, just ridiculous stories where he and I would end up just laughing in the middle of just like ridiculous arguments or or stuff. But uh my my favorite story that Joey would tell me wasn't something we experienced together, but when he would tell the story. I could almost visualize it because I knew the area in his town where he where he talked about it. But we used to talk about dumb stuff we used to do as as kids, you know, and like getting in trouble, you know, you know, fucking with your neighbor's yard or or something. And he used to tell me this story and I always used to ask him about it because it would always get him in a good mood and he could 
barely ever finish it because he would be laughing so hard in between telling me what he did. It was so juvenile and, and childish. Um, but he stole his mom's red, like reddest lipstick out of her makeup thing. And him and his friend went to this other dude's house they didn't like. And on their garage door, they just wrote the word shit <laughs> as big as the garage door and, and Joey's mom's red lipstick. And they just ran <laughs> off in the woods and laughed about it. But him just telling that story, he couldn't even, you know, it was a lot longer in the way I just explained it when he would tell it because he could never get like explaining like, what did you write? I wrote it. <laughs> 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 and uh, so I guess they went around in the neighborhood and knocked on all the doors and was like, do you know anybody that would have wrote shit on our, on our garage door? And Joey's mom's like, well, I might know. And she goes, <laughs> her red lipstick is gone. And they're just like, uh Oh, so I think Joey and that kid had to spend like their Sunday, like washing the neighbor's house and, oh. and washing shit off of, <laughs> off of that. So, I don't know. That's just a random story he would tell me. And that used to make me laugh. Makes me laugh now when I think about him telling it and just, just to show how, how juvenile we were about just like our humor was always like, you know, writing the word fart on something would just, you know, <laughs> would bring a light to our day every day. We would just like one time I, I got drunk on tour and I, I got uh, like fluorescent color, like gaff tape. And I wrote fart as big as I could on the side of the tour bus. <laughs> and our bus driver was so mad and our tour manager was mad, but Joey was so happy that I did that. Cause we were going with like, I think we went down the road for a while with a big giant fart and like pink <laughs> on this black bus. So it just looked ridiculous but uh it was a fun fun stuff like that that's my favorite stuff about him was when we could act like little kids and we did that as often as as we could i, love it. I remember years ago there was a video going around the internet and it was literally just you and joey in a car screaming hey. absolutely yeah. nothing i was like why is well, this so damn funny <laughs> it's, well it's funny because he's He's laughing in that too. And I'll give you an idea just how he was laughing. But that's his, that's him like really, really laughing at that. He's trying to keep the character, but there's a, there's a movie called Raisin Arizona with Nicolas Cage that he and I both grew up on. We, we knew it when we first met. That was one of the things we talked about. Oh, what's your favorite movie? Raisin Arizona. Oh my God. That's fav my favorite parts. This, 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 and this. And we just, we knew it. So uh, that was just one of the, one of the, one of the things that, that uh, th there's a scene in that movie where these two guys are in a car and they realize they left a baby in the middle of the road and they stop and they're just freaking out and they're turning around and they're driving and they're just going, ah, ah. <laughs> it's the greatest part in this movie. And we were just recreating that. We had no explanation for it. We just, the video <laughs> got online and, People now, like you ask the question, like, what the fuck are you guys doing? So if you want to see the, it's, it's called Raising Arizona. It's a famous movie, but the scene, the scene is John Goodman and uh, uh, I can't think of the other guy's name right now, but he was in Rob Zombie's movies. Uh, but yeah, it's this great scene where these guys are literally just screaming for about two minutes. And uh, that was our sense of humor. We would do that on airplanes. We'd do that on trains across <laughs> the world. Um, uh, it was always something funny with us, you know. People would always think it was all the spooky horror, dark stuff, but no, it was all usually comedy movies most of the time. I fucking love it. I, I I just I love stories like that, you know. It's because you know, like I said, us fans are missing, but at the end of the day, we didn't know him on a personal level. So it's it's amazing to hear, you know, these amazing stories about your heroes. And yeah, I I love it so much. <laughs> Yeah, man, he was a uh, he was a good dude. Like I said, he was uh, he was really down to earth. He was he was funny, but uh, his sense of humor was some people I don't think would ever ex expect from him. And uh, and it was always fun for me if I could make him laugh every day, like genuinely make him laugh. It made my day too, you know. So uh, we we worked we worked well together. 
Yeah. And he's a fucking incredible drummer. Oh my days. Yeah. Probably. Not to, not to mention that. Best. Yeah, he uh <laughs> he changed he changed drumming for 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 everybody. He changed it for all these up and coming drummers now. Like you didn't hear that that kind of drumming until him. You didn't hear that. Now it's everybody. I can hear it now. I can hear it in 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 so many bands now. It's just you know they've that high impact, fast drumming, the double bass. You know he set the bar bar high. And there's drummers now that you know are you know started off as little kids. You know watching him that are now like amazing. It's 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 insane. He he changed the game. Very good. absolutely. Very did. I always felt sorry for Ben a little bit. It's like you're the drummer in a band with. Joey Jordison. <laughs> it bothered him. It didn't bother him as much as I would, as I thought it would. He never really, I don't think Joey ever gave him any reason to be weird. He was never, he was never on him about like, do this or do this. It was just, Murder Dolls was just such a, I think such a release and a, for him out of Slipknot, it was, a project he didn't know what was going to do it had success he was in charge of it he could do whatever he wanted it was just a fast paced band we were drinking we were partying and i just remember all they ever did to band would be like play faster turn around and go up and up the beat i'm like we can't play any faster <laughs> yeah so so watch old videos of that. And you'll be like, how fast can these guys play? We give the Ramones a run for their money as far as like speeding up original versions versus like the live versions. Like it was just, it was insane. Incredible. But but let's let's talk about what you're doing now. You've just released your brand new album, Horrify, which as expected is phenomenal. I especially love Return to Haddonfield and Good Day to Be a Bad Guy. That is just an absolutely incredible song. But what's the feedback been like for the album so far? It's been great. Uh, you know, every time you put a record out, you hope people are going to like it. You know, um, you don't want to read bad reviews. You don't want to you don't want to disappoint your fans. So and this is the day and age where everybody lets you know their review, whether <laughs> it's a journalist or it's a Facebook, Instagram comment or 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 whatever. Uh but no, it's always a scary thing for me because I actually, I actually care. I actually care that our fans, uh, what they think, you know, I, I, I want to, I want to read positive. Uh, so the first, you know, week of the album being out, I read all those comments. I read all the YouTube comments. Um, uh, so it's, it's always, you know, good to see that the majority of the people love it or took the time to actually talk about that, that they liked it. Uh, you know, I was actually looking afraid to go to the next comment going, Oh, where's the, where's the bad comment coming? But there really was no, I mean, there's a handful to be expected out of thousands and thousands of comments. And there's just a two or three I can think of that somebody said something negative, but it really wasn't negative. Like, uh, like sometimes a comment would be like, uh, it was some magazine reviewed the album and said, um, if you're looking for shock rock that was done 20, 30 years ago, this is the perfect album for you. But if you're looking for something new, this is not the record for you. And I'm like, what's wrong with shock rock from 20, 30 years ago? That's, oh, what, yeah. I, that's <laughs> what I do. That's my influence. So you just said what I do bad at <laughs> is like, <"This> is <laughs> is so you read those kind of reviews. So, uh but again i guess as long as people are talking about it uh if if i can put out you know this is the ninth album you know and i always look at someone's album catalog when i get to that number at least the way i feel about it because i'm always judging myself and trying to be my worst critic but like i always compare it to movies and i'm like all right where was the halloween franchise by part nine and i'm like is it where i checked out like I don't want to be Halloween part nine from that friend. I want to be the version that I, that I want to see, you know? So uh, that's why it's important for me when it's the ninth album, not to get into that mentality of going, who cares? I'll just write some songs. Fuck it. 
you know, I, mm-hmm. I get into it. It's a, it's a process. So, uh, so yeah, I don't want to make, I think of my albums as sequels. I don't ever want to put out, you know, Friday the 13th part five. I don't want to make that album. And I'm sure to some people I've made several of those, but whatever. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's always, uh, a, a good thing is to see a positive response to something that would normally get chewed apart. I feel like, uh, so luckily, uh, you know, we're still doing what we do that people like it. So. Absolutely. Are there any songs on the album that you're particularly like, especially proud of? You're just like, yeah, I like this one. This is a good one. Um, I think good day to be a bad guy was, is one of the, one of the first ones that I, that I came up with. And I knew instantly, I was like, that was one of the ones where I was literally just watching TV and I had my guitar in my hand and I just did the, and I would kind of sound like a nursery rhyme or something. And I came up with a good day to be a bad guy. I was watching, I was watching TV. It was right when the COVID stuff happened, right when the, and I live here in California. So in Los Angeles, they were the first people to do the mass mandate, at least in the, in the U.S., and I remember watching TV and I'm sitting there playing, playing that little part on guitar. And they were like, and today in, in the news is masks are mandatory. And when you first heard that before it became a normal thing, first you're kind of like, what the fuck? Mandatory mask. Really? Like everywhere? Everywhere. You have to wear a mask into the grocery store. You have to wear a mask. And here and in my brain, you know, I'm thinking like, because I watch movies my whole life. And I'm thinking, what about the bank? <laughs> you ask in the bank, even at the bank, and I went. It's a good day to be a bad guy, <laughs> and I just went. Oh, it's a good day, <laughs> and I went. Boom, and that's how that song happened. Literally in a in a ten minute thing of watching the news, and I instantly knew I had a cool song. So when I finally got to track that with a with a drummer and and go in the studio and do everything. And I heard the playback on it. I was like, this is this is a good one. It's one of those ones that I know will will last for years. We can always play it at a live show. It's a it's like an instant, instant classic because we did it on this last tour. And it's before the album came out for anybody had heard the song. And I'm like, you don't know this song, but you're going to know it when we're done because you're going to wake up tomorrow with it stuck in your head. And uh, and for the most part, that, that was the reaction we got. So that was one of my one of my songs, I think, that. Instantly, I knew I had a good one. That's like a Rambo-worthy, catchy. <laughs> you you got to love those catchy songs. You say with Rambo, that's been going to, what, how many years ago was Rambo released? And it's still. It's, just, it's so easy to do. And it's so silly when you think about it. But it's so simple. And that's what I wanted to do uh, with, with that song. I wanted to do something that was simple and fun. And to, again, like I said, those songs come to me pretty easy. Uh, I could probably do a whole album of songs like that if I really sat down and, and wanted to do it. Uh, that's what my brain wants to write a lot of times, stuff like that, even though, I don't know, some people are like, that, do that next time. Maybe I will. I don't know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, re- I'm really, really proud of that song. Uh, also dig the the song Return to Haddonfield. That turned out really cool, I think, for because I, I took a while, I took a break where I wasn't really writing songs about horror movies particularly cause I did that so much in the beginning. I was like, where do I go from this point? But, uh, but when I finished that song and I, and I wrote it about the Halloween series or like the part two of the, of the movie, uh, I sat back and I went, this is a really good song. This is probably one of the best horror movie songs that I've did in a while. You know, I kind of sat back, kind of separate myself and went, I was, you know, going to be the critic on myself. I would say, would this stand in the, would this stand the, test the time as it go head to head with some of the other songs and i i think it does i absolutely love haddonfield the original version off fang bang so i was like oh a sequel yes exactly. <laughs> see that's it see it works if you if you don't know it it's cool but if you know it it's even better because that was one of my favorites from that record and uh, i know it was a lot of a lot of people's favorite off that record incredible T- talking of playing live and all these songs with so many songs in your back catalog now how do you go about creating a set list for your shows? Oh, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. I mean, it's it's really hard to it's hard to make one out because you know I always try to put myself in the audience. I always try to go. If you were in the audience, what would you want to hear? 
you know, and I always try to think about what's your, you know, what is your favorite band? And like, for me, like, a like, like Alice Cooper, for example, is an artist that I've listened to from the beginning to where he is right now. So I have a familiar with everything he's done. Uh, so, you know, I always picture like, well, if I was in the audience watching Alice Cooper, what would I want to hear? And like, so I kind of use that fan mentality of that. So I sit, imagine myself in the audience watching, watching us going, well, they're going to want to hear this one off this album. I got to do that one. I got to do this one. If I don't play this one, I could probably get by without that one. So it's it literally it's 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 juggling and then looking at the clock and going, how many songs can I fit into that mm. time that we have on stage? So yeah, it gets more difficult. And then every time you put a new record out, you want to play a song or two new. So then there's two new ones that knock out two of the old ones. So the people that came there just to hear the old ones are like, I don't want to hear that new shit. Play the old <laughs> stuff. You're like, I gotta play the new stuff, you know. So it's just it's one of it's one of those things. Oh, I can I can only imagine. Yeah. So with your theatricalness and how much you love being on stage and doing all the bits and pieces of the umbrellas and the chickens and the toilets and God knows what else, music yes. videos then, the process mm. of them, not the actual done deal, the actual process of them, love it or hate it. Mm. Uh, do I love it or hate it? The process? Yeah, as it? in like the actual, yeah, actually making the music, like. Do you come up with the ideas yourself? Are you told what you should be doing? Like how like do you enjoy making music? Because I know they take a long ass time, don't they? Yeah, I I do. I I enjoy. I enjoy what I do. Uh and I enjoy um, you know, all this stuff is fun to me. To pull off a a, a trick with the, the chicken or any of that stuff, it's like a, <laughs> I feel like I'm a magician. So I'm, I even made up the word musician. I'm a musical <laughs> magician. I pull a pull a rabbit out of a out of a hat um you know just uh, i don't know those things are accomplishments to do uh there was even one time i i i came out of a regular size trash can on stage one time too that was a that was a great moment i did uh, a lot of a lot of work uh but uh yeah i came out i looked like oscar the grouch came out of the trash can it was uh it was amazing Phenomenal. But, you know, you've done some incredible music videos over the years. Uh, Home Sweet Homicide will always be a standout for me. Just the clowns. <laughs> it's brilliant. Yes. So before we start wrapping up, I, a question I like to ask all musicians. If there's someone listening to this interview now, one of a, and they've never heard of Wednesday 13 before, but is there a particular song or songs of yours you'd point them in the direction of? Like a true example of what Wednesday 13 is about. I don't know. Um, I think, uh, you know, over the test of time, the main songs that stand out are like people love my song, Bad Things, off the first album. I think that's a good example of of kind of what you would what you would get throughout the career of what we've done. It's got the sense of humor, the lyrics. Uh, it's got the sleazy hard rock vibe that we've always zoned into um, that. I love to say fuck. Uh, which I've recorded with all the bands, <laughs> with the solo, <laughs> first of all, um, you know, if you get that, then I think your ears will be open to to most of it. Incredible. I'm always a zombie. That's another good one too. That's a, that's one that even works on children. You can play that in a car with your kids and they'll just want to sing zombie, zombie. <laughs> I'm going to test that. It, it, it works. It works. They love it. I have a five-year-old. I'm testing that. I want to see All if that right, works. Out. Most five-year-olds, <laughs> most five-year-olds like it. <laughs> <Let me go. laughs> Mr. Stevens, any more questions for our wonderful guests? What I thought was really awesome was you mentioned about your song "Good Day to Be a Bad Guy." You released a chocolate hazelnut tea. Is that correct? <laughs> or a tea leaf is, called that, "Good Day right. to Be a Bad Chai"? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I uh, yeah, we we started working with this company called Brutalities um they're big fans of the band and uh they came in with a bunch of like um ideas and different like you should have heard half the songs they give their song title puns for different teas like probably 10 or 15 different ones it was home sweet homicider uh, <laughs> yeah all, all kinds of cool weird stuff and uh but yeah we just we tested it out um uh, we launched it on, on Halloween with them. I have yet to, I have not taste. I'm not really a tea person. 
Uh, I've yet to taste it. Uh, but uh, the results from everybody so far, because we actually, uh, people already got their orders in. So I'm, I'm reading reviews online. Like, did I poison anybody? No, <laughs> did not. Uh, but no, the reaction has been really good uh, so far. It's my first time doing anything. I think that's edible or, or drinkable uh, in my line of merch. So, you know, I like to compete with kiss in my line of merchandise of everything I can put out, whether it's a mass quantity or not. Like I want to go to the limit. I want everything. I want the, the Wednesday 13 bedroom set with curtains for your kid's room. Get in the bed with Wednesday 13. <laughs> Where does that many sound? Fair, a Wednesday 13 coffin would be very on brand. And there is a kiss coffin. So yeah, I mean, there's everything. Someone was like, you know, I was watching a commercial the other day and it was a nut company. I was like, what if I get nuts and I could advertise it? Hey, put my nuts in your mouth. Wednesday 13 <laughs> nuts. I'm nutty for these nuts. Won't you won't you put my nuts in your mouth this holiday season? <laughs> like I've worked out all the commercials, trying to do the straight face. It's hard to say nuts in your mouth without laughing. But I've been practicing. So we'll see one day. Uh, tea today, nuts tomorrow. <laughs> I don't know. Laugh. I don't, I don't know. That's the first thing that came to mind. But yeah. Obviously, when you began your journey uh, in in the music world, did you ever think that, however many years on the way are now, that you would be where you are today, nine albums, etc.? Uh, I think I hoped that I would be able to still be doing. I don't. I've never really thought about you know where I would be or what. I think it just this, the main thing is just I always want to be making music, and that's all the thing that I've been good at i think i'm good at and uh and it's fun you know it doesn't feel like a job for me when i when i do this so uh but no i mean i i i, I didn't think but at the same time i didn't really have any backup plans so maybe i was not really thinking it wouldn't happen i don't know i just always had that mindset you know uh but like i thought as soon as i got out of high school i would be touring and doing everything but it took about five or six years for that to, to take off. So I always know that there's always potential for something not to happen the way you think it will. But uh, I've been really, I've been really fortunate, but I also, I, I work my ass off too. I, I stay busy. I've, you know, I've went away when sometimes I probably should have went away and I didn't, I didn't, you know, people were like, Oh, you should give it up. Like, Nope. You know? Uh, so yeah, I've just, uh, you know, I've dug my, I've dug my claws into this <laughs> world and I, I refuse to uh, to give up. I'm like a cockroach. I'm still going to keep coming back after after everything. Good. Don't want it to go anywhere. But yeah. have you got anything coming up that you're able to talk about? I know you recently had to cancel the remainder of your tour, but, mm -hmm. but is there anything other plans coming up? Yeah, we have, uh, we have uh, at the end of January, I think it's January 26th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, uh, we go to Australia. Uh, it's our first time back in Australia since before the pandemic. Uh, and it's a really cool, unique tour. Um, we're going with, uh, it's it's called Glam Fest uh, 2023. And it's us and a bunch of my favorite uh, uh, glam, what it, Sunset Strip, uh, sleaze hair metal bands. It's, uh, it's us. Faster Pussycat, Pretty Boy Floyd, oh. Enough Enough. Uh, and it's like a, it's an all-day lineup sort of deal. We're co-headlining it with Faster Pussycat. And uh, for me, that's, this is just, I can't think of a more fun tour we've been offered. You know, uh, we did a lot of stuff. We play with, and that's the cool thing about our band and being diverse and what we've done is that we can cater a set to a tour like that. We can play all the cool rock, glam rock, type stuff and then we can go and play with cradle of filth you know and do our heavy <laughs> stuff so we we balance that out pretty well so that's something that i've been really fortunate to do and i'm able to be able to go and play shows with with bands like this hopefully it's be something that'll that'll do well and uh we just did a few sh uh, show uh maybe i don't know two or three months ago with uh with lita ford and enough's enough and it was sort of a and that gave the promoters this idea to put this together so if that keeps happening 
you may see us with some some more bands like that. I just uh, I love to play uh, in front of any any audience, but I think some of those audiences would get where we come from. They get past the Captain Howdy corpse paint. Phenomenal. I, I can't wait for you to come back over in the UK. Like I, past two shows I had tickets to and they got bloody cancelled on me. So I'm like, come on. Go on. So yeah, we're, we're, talk, we're talking about the UK, I think uh, uh, April, May right now. So uh, yeah, we're still, we're still getting stuff together, but, uh, but yeah, our next, our next trip is Australia at the end of January. And then we're going to start filling the rest of the year up and uh, another, another busy year ahead. I see. Phenomenal. Um, before we let go over, any plugs, social medias, any websites or anything you want people to go and check out and follow uh, you on? I'm on all the social media pages. Uh, we have our Instagram and uh, Facebook, but you get all that info on uh, officialwednesday13.com. That has the links to uh, all those pages. It has a link to our web store. You can get all of our merchandise. Um, there's also the Patreon fan club that I that I do. I've been doing since the pandemic started, which is uh, – a cool little community of fans that uh, I got to see a lot on the tours this year. They all met up. It's called the, my fan club's called the Wednesday 13s and Necro Phasers. Um, and uh, they call themselves the Necro family. So they come out to all of our shows. They're just super supportive of, of each other. And uh, I've created a cool little community of fans uh, during that time off the road during the, the COVID stuff phenomenal that is awesome check it out it's available so if you uh if you want to hang out with a cool group of people and i do live stories and check in and uh lots of cool little perks and things there's a comic book we do for the for the fan club uh just lots of lots of fun stuff and i take it all from the stuff i grew up on like what would be the ultimate fan club ah oh, you get a membership card but how about if i put you in a comic book and you get to get killed monthly by me how about that that's a good idea so uh awesome. lots of lots of fun things uh in the fan club so come check it out become one of us <laughs> you got a world you've got a calling in the world of re of advertising you do i love it it's phenomenal <laughs> thank you wait that this has been so much fun thank you so much for doing this it means the absolute world thank you for having me okay thank you so much sir. this means the absolute world please go enjoy the rest of your day like yeah massive thank you oh. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Take care, Wednesday. Take care, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. I, I just... What a phenomenal interview. So funny. It's great. Just, it oh, is great. Yeah. Just to watch you in your element, it's really fucking good. So I hope everybody enjoys it because it's it's just what just for Jamie, just for the fact that he just hones his interviewing skills and smashes it straight out of the proverbial park. I can't thank you enough. And a massive thank you to you as well. Because I know I mentioned it in the trailer. You rearranged some personal plans for this to happen. So that meant the absolute world to me. So, yeah, I love you. It's, not, it's one of those things where it's like, we can't really. It, I'd be a dick if we rearranged it. <laughs> um, but, guys, it's incredible. Thank you so much for listening to it. We would just really hope that you guys enjoyed listening to it as much as we did recording it. Wednesday, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. You made my co host's dreams come true. All right. Is this thing on? Well, howdy doody, everybody. This is Braden Berry from Say We Can Fly, founder of Stay Cozy Clothing. Your one-stop shop for the coziest, most fashionable hoodies, t-shirts, and more. Gorsh, Mickey. That's right, folks. And we're proud to say that we are now sponsoring... The Chronicles of Podcast. Ouch. Hosted by Tom and Jamie. <laughs> like, you can get 10% off, man. That's right, Shaggy. Just use the special code, The Chronicles, at checkout. Oh, boy. Oh.